Welcome to Choice Classic Radio, where we bring to you the greatest old-time radio shows. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and thank you for donating at choiceclassicradio.com. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Silver Blast. And so it is that the prophecy of charming shall be fulfilled. For the evil committed, your reward is death. And from the mouth of the flask poured a crawling white fog, which became quite dense, and then assumed the size and shape of the demon of the night, and it reached its hands towards his throat. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. Ah! In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Silver Flask. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Silver Flask. And so it was that you town called the Silver Flask to be made. Small and thin it was with a diamond embedded into its face so that it could see. And he summoned the sorcerer Chow Ming and bade him bestow upon this lamp the mantle of magic. And this was done. For goodness, it will return good. For evil, it will bring death. began commonly enough. Chris and Pat Renfield and I had dropped into an art dealer shop in the avenue. I don't know what made us go in. I think it's mere circumstance. There was an auction going on. Going once, going twice, three times and gone, sold to the lady in the brown fur coat. Oh, that was a bargain. Chris, a real bargain. I don't know, maybe. I wonder what'll be up next. Probably an old bed warmer. <laughs> oh, we must well leave. I don't think there's anything here we'd be interested in, Pat. Oh, just a few more minutes, Chris. But we'll be late for... Oh, all right, Pat, but just a few minutes. Oh, now there's a husband for you. May I ask for your attention once more, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. Now I ask you to look at the object in front of me. It's a flask, a silver flask. Perhaps tarnished a trifle, but silver nonetheless. How old this object is, no one has been able to ascertain. How it came into the possession of this company is a mystery. But the workmanship is definitely oriental. For a collector's item, it would be perfect. I like the Now, who will start the bidding on I this think I will. piece of art? Come, come, ladies and gentlemen. Who will be the first to make a bid on the silver flask? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, ten dollars. Ten dollars. The man in the blue overcoat bid ten dollars. Do I hear fifteen? Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty dollars for the silver flask before me. Twenty dollars is the bid. Do I hear twenty-five? Twenty-five. Thirty. Fifty. Fifty. No, 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 Chris. Fifty dollars is the bid. Fifty dollars. Do I hear more? Fifty dollars is the bid. Going once. Fifty dollars going twice. Fifty dollars for the third time. Sold to Mr. Henry Seven. Come on, let's get out of here. All right, Chris. You really wanted that flask, didn't you, Chris? Yes, I... I don't know why, though. Oh, it just caught your eye, that's all, darling. Excuse me. Uh, pardon me, please. Will you let me go through? Now look, Chris. There's the man who outbid you. Oh, he seems to be coming over here. He's waving to us. I wonder what he wants. Uh, please, madam, will you let me by? Uh, thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help but notice you bidding against me. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry that only one of us could own the silver flask. Oh, it's perfectly all right. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Stebbins, Henry Stebbins. I'm retired now, you see, and my hobby is collecting unusual art objects. Uh, your name is... Oh, Chris. excuse me, Mr. Stebbins. This is Larry Reardon. How do you do? My wife, Pat Redfield. How do you do? And Chris is mine. Uh, really? 
I'm uh, very pleased to meet you, all of you, you know. Uh, are you by any chance interested in collecting art objects, uh, Mr. Redfield? I have an interest. I'm not a collector. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Redden? I'm afraid I'm in the same category as Chris. I see. Well, I was wondering, I do have a rather good collection, you know, and I hope you won't think it presumptuous, but it's so infrequent that one meets people who are interested in the same things as he. Uh, why don't you, uh, all of you, uh, come to dinner at my house next week, uh, say Monday? Why, of course, Mr. Stebbins, we'd be delighted. Uh, here's my card. Uh, you will come, won't you? I'm sure you'll find it very interesting. The following Monday, we went to Henry Stebbins' house. He seemed quite wealthy, for the house was large and lavishly furnished. After the meal, he showed us his collection, pausing finally when he came to the silver flask. As you can see, the flask is uh, a bit different, uh, shall we say, from when you saw it last. Why, why, it's as bright as a new coin. <laughs> that stone in the center, it wasn't there when I saw it at the auction. Oh, yes, yes, it was. It had been covered over by a thin layer of silver. I noticed the imperfection and uh, took it off. <laughs> Underneath was the diamond. diamond. Are you sure? Are you sure it's a diamond? Oh, quite sure, Mr. Redfield. You see, the silver flask has quite a history. It's really very ancient. Yeah, how old is it? Oh, at least 3,000 years, possibly more. It's a relic of the Juan dynasty. Lost for over two centuries. How do you know these facts, Mr. Stebbins? Uh, I've been watching for the flask for several years. Many times I was sure I'd found it, but <laughs> needless to say, I was disappointed. At last, however, it's in my possession. <laughs> Would you like to know some of its history? Oh, yes, yes very much. All right, then. It was first ordered made by the Chinese Emperor Yu Duan, made for him by the sorcerer Zhao Ming, who also was responsible for a certain jade dagger I would like to possess. Uh, Zhao Ming bestowed this magic upon it. For goodness, it would return good. And for evil, it would bring death. The flask was in the family of Yu Juan for many generations. However, 100 years after it was first made, the last of the Juan was emperor. A member of his court plotted against him. Strangely enough, the original motivation was possession of the silver flask. But the night he came to steal the flask... Who's there, Emperor? Emperor, Who is in here? What do you want? <laughs> Where are you? It is so dark my eyes cannot see. It is pity your Nazi dagger which brings your death. <laughs> Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Silver Flask. Our eyes were upon Stebbins as he talked. Yet we saw not the man before us, but the scene which his words conjured up in our minds. Is this story true, Mr. Stebbins? Every word of it, Mr. Redden. Is that all to the story? Oh, no, not at all. There's a good deal more to it. A good deal. I'd like to hear the rest of the story. Are you sure I'm not uh, <laughs> boring you? Oh, no. No, no, no. All right, then. Uh, let me see... Uh, where was I? The emperor had just been murdered. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, what had originally started as a covetous fascination about the silver flask resulted in the murder of the last of the Juans. The killer knew of the supposed magical properties of the flask, yet he thought it only legend with no true significance. He took the silver flask with him when he left the side of the murdered emperor. No one knew of the emperor's death. And when the killer retired for the night, he put the silver flask next to his bed... But he was unable to get to sleep, and his gaze was drawn to the diamond in the flask, the all-seeing eye that Zhao Ming had given it. It began to glow and shine in the darkness, becoming a thing alive. The killer watched it in horrible fascination, and then he heard a voice. And so it is that the prophecy of Zhao Ming shall be fulfilled. For the evil committed, your reward is dead. And from the mouth of the flask poured a crawling white frog which became dense and then assumed the size and shape of a demon of the night and it reached its hands toward his throat. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. 
so perish the killer of the last of the Juans. It's, it's a rather fantastic story. Fantastic? Perhaps the pattern has been repeated many times since, and perhaps it will be again. There is something quite fascinating about it. Yes, Mr. Redfield. <laughs> quite fascinating. Of course, all that happened many years ago. I don't believe it's actually true. It's probably like so many other legends that changed during the passage of the centuries. And now a person or object with supernatural power. Even though what actually occurred originally was nothing out of the ordinary. Well, that's quite possible, Mr. Reardon. But as a collector of these objects and their histories, I much rather prefer to believe the legend, as you call it. <laughs> Chris? Chris? Hmm? What? Oh, you're so quiet. What were you thinking about? It's really quite fascinating. The flask. I can hardly take my eyes off it. The evening ended shortly thereafter with another invitation from Henry Stebbins that would return soon. Chris was silent as we drove home. His mind lost in thought, only occasionally joining in the conversation. I knew that he was thinking about the silver flash. I was inclined to think of the story Henry Stebbins had told us as coming from a man who was highly nervous, a man who, because of his loneliness and preoccupation with himself, would read into the slightest glance a willingness to commit murder. Three days later, Pat Redfield dropped into my office. I hope you don't mind my coming in to see you like this, Larry. Oh, of course not, Pat. It's a pleasure. Cigarette? No, 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 thanks. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, how did you... What a look on your face. What's bothering you? It's Chris. Chris? That's right, Larry. I, I know it's a, it's a strange term to use, but for the last three days, he seems like a, like a man possessed. Even at night when he's asleep, he has a nightmare. He talks and screams out. When did this start? That night we'd seen Henry Stebbins. I can't understand most of his words, but every once in a while I hear him say something about the silver flask. He seems to be struggling with someone or, or something. Oh, I just don't know. I'm so worried. I, I can't even think. Oh, it's a story that Stebbins told us. I know, but, but there must be some truth to it, Larry. Look at the tremendous fascination the silver flask holds for Chris. Sometimes I even think he'd be willing to kill Stebbins just to get his hands on it. <laughs> In the evenings, I took to parking my car across the street from Stebbins' house to see who his callers might be. About a week after Pat had been to my office, I'd been parked across from his house for several hours. It was almost midnight, and I was on the point of starting my car and driving home. But on my side of the street, about half a block away, I saw a familiar figure walking towards me. He walked slowly. Like a man in a trance. His head turned so that his eyes were on Stebbins' house. Chris? What are you doing out here, Chris? I might ask you the same question. They're waiting for you. Why me? Why not someone else? Because no one else has an interest in the silver flask. Has Pat been talking to you? Not recently. Then you know all about it, don't you, Larry? But I want the silver flask, that I'm going to get it now, tonight. No, you're not, Chris. Yes, I am, Larry. Now, get out of my way. Put that knife back in your pocket, you fool. It's pretty, isn't it? Just press a button and the blade snaps open. Out of my way. You're not going anywhere with that knife. No, we'll see about that. Oh, you yes. asked for it, Larry. Oh, let go of my arm. Drop that knife. Drop it. Drop it. All right. That's better. This little thing. Now get into the car. Oh, I'll get into the car, all right, Larry. I won't make any fuss about that. You think you're doing me a favor by stopping me. I don't. Maybe my chance is lost tonight, but I'll get another. Don't worry about that. There isn't anything that's going to stand in my way. Not you, not Pat, most certainly not Stebbins. I'd even commit murder to get that silver flask. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Silver Flask. Chris was quiet and sullen as I drove him home. He didn't say a word to me all the while we were together. I watched him enter the front door of his house, and I drove back to my apartment. 
When I got there, I called Henry Stephens. Hello? Mr. Stebbins, this is Larry Reardon. Oh, yes. You'd better make sure that your house is locked up tight from now on. Your friend? Yes. I've been watching the front of your house for several nights. Tonight, about midnight, I saw Chris. I think he intended to break in. I'll be careful. <laughs> Thanks for calling. In the morning, for some reason, Henry Stebbins phoned first the Redfields and then me. And asked us to come to dinner that night. I couldn't understand his line of reasoning unless he enjoyed playing a cat and mouse game with Chris. Pat didn't want to go, but Chris insisted, and promptly at seven we were at Stebbins' house. We finished the meal and adjourned to the library. I'd like to see your collection again, Mr. Stebbins. Oh, I'll be glad to show it to you. Uh, would you two like to come with us? No, I'll stay here if you don't mind. So will I. All right. Then just you and I'll go to see it, Chris. Suits me. Hey, we'll be back in a little while. I wonder if we should have let him go along. Chris won't try anything while we're here, Pat. I hope you're right. Besides, I'm sure that Stebbins can protect himself. Oh, I'm worried about him, Larry. Chris has changed, so. When we're alone, he never says anything anymore. He just doodles on a scratch pad with a pencil. Always draws the same picture. The silver glass? Yes. I think something's wrong with his mind. Oh, I don't think what it's anything. Well, where's the silver glass? Come on, Pat. We shouldn't have let him go alone. I think it would be best to put the glass away. I know it disturbs you quite strongly. Oh, I could kill you. Oh, we have a Stop them, Larry. Don't worry. Now, stay away from me, Red Beard. You'd be better off. Don't worry. All right, now. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. He knew I wanted to see the flask. He hid it on purpose. I thought it would be the wisest thing to do. Oh, Chris, how could you do such a thing? Let's just forget this ever happened. Well, I, I'm perfectly willing to do that, you know. <laughs> I really don't mean to gloat, Mr. Redfield, but I have the silver flask and you haven't, and I know you wanted it. Why, you? Yes. Uh, you see, that's why I hid it from you. After all, as long as you don't know where it is, my life is safe. Isn't that right? <laughs> Stebbins was right, of course. As long as Chris didn't know the whereabouts of the silver flask, Stebbins' life would be safe. But if Chris knew where it was with his overpowering obsession to own it and Stebbins stood in the way, his life would mean nothing to Chris. But Chris had told me that he wouldn't stop, even at murder. And so it was that your drum caused the silver flask to be made. And he summoned the sorcerer Chow Ming and got him to store upon the flask the mantle of magic. And this was done. Two days later, I was home in the apartment. I sat down with a good book, and it was about 11 o'clock when the phone rang. Yes? Oh, Larry, this is Pat. You'd better go over to the Stebbins' house right away. Why? Chris came home this evening, sat, fidgeted all night long, and then, then about 15 minutes ago, he muttered something about the silver flask and ran out of the house. You think he was going to see Stebbins? Yes, yes, I, I think so. You, you have to hurry over there, Larry, before he does anything. Have you called Stebbins? Yes, yes, I, I warned him. But Chris might do anything. Oh, go over there, Larry. See that he does nothing wrong. I have the strangest feeling that Stebbins is going to die tonight. Last the time would come. I knew it would. Sooner or later, Chris had to be stopped from entering that house at all costs. I hopped into my car and drove over to Stebbins' place as quickly as I could. Within 15 minutes, I was knocking on his front door. Oh, I'm glad you came, Larry. Pat phoned you, didn't she? Yes, I'm sorry I took so long coming to the door, but I was looking out the front window to see who it was. Uh, come in. It's strange what power the silver flask has, Larry. You should never have invited him back here after I told you what had happened. Oh, we might as well go into the library. You know, I think you'd better call the police. You think it's that serious? Yes. Yeah, I'll call from the library. Is your house secure? Oh, yes. Everything's locked and bolted. Hey, sit down, won't you? I'll phone the police. Stebbins. Flask still hidden? What? Oh, no, no, it's over there on the table. Perhaps the police can send a man out and you'll be able to go home. Oh, uh, hello? 
Uh, my name is Henry Stebbins. Uh, I have good reason to believe that someone is going to make an attempt on my life tonight. What? Name? Uh, uh, Chris Redfield. He's wanted something of mine for some time. He'll do anything to get it. Yes. Yes, I, I'd appreciate that. Yes, thank you very much. I'll have a man out here in 15 minutes. I didn't tell you that Chris had a knife the night he came here to kill you, did I? No, you didn't. Well, that's funny. Still have it with me. Well, we'll give it to the police when they get here. Yes, I'm sure they'll find it. What? The knife. I'm sure the police will find it. What do you mean? This. It's Chris's knife. You should never have been afraid of him, Mr. Stebbins. Chris would never really kill you. But I would. Stay away from me. I can't do that. You see, Stebbins, everything fits in perfectly now. You've warned the police against Chris. They'll find his knife. They'll never suspect me. You're insane. No, far from it. I merely want the silver flask. The curse. Don't forget the curse. Who believes in curses, Mr. Stebbins? Don't come any closer. Just close enough. Ah! Good night, Mr. Stebbins. I have the silver flask. It stands in the dresser next to my bed. The diamond shines so in the dark. It seems almost to be getting brighter. I imagine the police are looking for Chris Wright. The diamond is getting brighter. And there's something else. The sound. Like the sound of escaping air. There's something here in this room with me. And so it was that your charm caused the silver flask to be made. Small and thin it was, with a diamond embedded into its face so that it could see. And he summoned the father of Charmaine and bade him bestow upon the flask the mantle of magic. And this was done. For goodness, it will return good. For evil, it will bring death. Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs>